All right, so we have studied Mendel's paper to a great extent in great detail. That means we know genetics. Well, let's find out. All right, I want you to consider this. These are snapdragons, these flowers. They're called that because they're sort of shaped like the face of a dragon. And this snapdragon, if I were to take uh, this one and interbreed it with this one, these two different varieties, what would you predict I get? Well, you can use your understanding of Mendel's predictions and so forth to predict this. It's pink. And if I mix red with white here, I get pink. Okay. Now, notice this actually looks like generative fluid, doesn't it? It's We're mixing paint almost. We get pink here. All right, so here's a question for you. First of all, red snapdragons we know have genotype big A, big A. So this is following along Mendel's principle. Again, each trait has two uh, genes determining it, or two particles determining it, and uh, these are big A, big A. And these guys here, these white ones, are little a, little a. All right, and the pink ones, therefore, must be big A, little a, because I get a big A from the red, little a from the white. The offspring must be heterozygous, just like we saw before. All right, here's two questions for you. First of all, which allele is dominant, the big A or the little a? Right, think about that for a moment. Which of them is dominant? And which trait, therefore, is the recessive trait? Okay, true or false? White is a recessive trait, and the allele that's dominant is big A, because that's the way we always write it. The answer would be incorrect. That is not true. That is false. Here's what I need you to do. I need you to fall back on the definition, the technical definition of dominance. Dominance is if a trait is fully expressed in the heterozygote, that trait is dominant, and the allele that causes that trait is dominant. Okay, so the allele, big A, is causing red. This is not red, so therefore A, big A, cannot be dominant. Same thing, white is caused by little a. This is not white, therefore little a cannot be dominant. If neither allele is dominant, then neither of the homozygote phenotypes is dominant. So red is not dominant, and white is not dominant. So what's going on here? Well, this is one of the violations of Mendel's principle. Let's fall back on what we talked about before. Remember, Mendel couldn't get people to uh, believe what he was saying, largely because they were seeing more this kind of thing with blending inheritance, which led to the generative fluid idea, than they were seeing of what he was saying, dominance. And that tells us something. The pattern that Mendel saw is rare. And again, I can't emphasize that enough. So. If, some, if somebody asks you, is a trait dominant or recessive, the best answer you can give is, it's neither one. Okay, or it, it's, it, those concepts don't apply. All right, I'm going to show you a series of examples, of counterexamples to Mendelian principles. Now, traits that do follow Mendel's pattern are called Mendelian. So we can say this, Mendelian traits are rare. Here is an example of a non-Mendelian trait in humans. What you're looking at here on this side of the slide is a perfectly normal human red blood smear. This is just taking blood, putting it on a glass slide, and looking at it under a microscope after you stain it. And each one of these little tiny things looks almost like a donut is a red blood cell, and then these are all white blood cells. These are neutrophils. There are other things, little tiny purple dots are uh, platelets, and they come from naked karyocytes. And you've studied all this. You'll probably study all this uh, at some point. There's five different types of what white blood cells. We don't see them here. All right, this is all normal. Now, there is, in this condition, quite a bit of abnormality evident. In this condition, you notice the red blood cells are not shaped properly. This one's kind of crenated a little bit. It's all shriveled up, and they're all weird shaped, and the platelets are big, and so on. So this sort of picture here tells us there's a pathology going on. This blood is not normal. Something wrong with it. Now, this particular thing is a really nasty form of anemia called thalassemia. And thalassemia has two different sort of levels. This one is thalassemia major. This is the, the major pathological form. Now, there is a minor form of this, and the minor form of it is more or less normal. It's uh, usually people are asymptomatic with it. They discover that they have it because when they get sick with something else, the treatment doesn't work quite right, so they get tested for it and they discover that they have it. Uh, and typically, they have a little bit less hemoglobin in, in, their, uh, in their blood, but their uh, red blood cell count is elevated, so that's another clue that you can have. We can actually test for it genetically directly nowadays, so it's not that hard to discover. But the major form is really bad. It's very severe, and it causes a really nasty anemia that, uh, that without treatment, invariably causes death before puberty or at the time of puberty. 
from generalized organ failure, usually earlier. Now, even with treatment, it's very hard to keep a person alive up into their 40s with this disease. So this disease has a series of patterns, and it's genetic. And I want to show you what the pattern is, and then let's see if we can deduce what's going on here. Okay? So here are the patterns. All right? Now, if we see a healthy person have a child with another healthy person, uh, when I say healthy here, I mean they don't have either thalassemia. They have neither th thalassemia major nor thalassemia minor. What would you predict? What do you expect to see out of that mating? The other mating that we could get, for example, would be a healthy individual and somebody with thalassemia minor. That's the most common one that's associated with this disease. What would we predict out of that? And then what would we predict out of this? Thalassemia minor having a child with somebody else with thalassemia minor. What would you expect to see? All right. Now, we could notice that uh, there is no thalassemia major in any of these possibilities. And the reason for that is we just don't see that mating very often, if at all, because of the fact that the people who have thalassemia major usually don't live long enough, or if they do live long enough, they're not healthy enough to have children. All right, so these are the major ones that we can figure out. Okay, so if you're coming at this from a Mendelian perspective, you ask which one is dominant, and then you try and, and figure out from there. But there is a warning sign here. Notice there's three phenotypes, not two. There's healthy, thalassemia minor, and thalassemia major. And that instantly tells us Mendelianism is probably not what's going on here. Okay, so let's take a look here and try to make out what's actually happening here. Okay, so we know, or at least we have some clue that it's not Mendelian. So let's look to see what we've actually observed in these matings. Now, having a healthy, healthy interaction, in other words, having an individual who's healthy, another individual who's healthy, have a, have a child, always leads to a child who's healthy. And by healthy, I mean they don't have either thalassemia major or thalassemia minor. They're perfectly healthy. Now, in this situation, it often comes up that people will say, well, wait a minute, isn't it possible that there's a chance that two healthy individuals can have somebody with thalassemia? And the answer is yes, that's possible. But that's not what I'm saying. I'm not laying out here what's possible. I'm laying out here what we've seen in reality. And we've never seen, at least to my knowledge, we've never had any documented case of two healthy individuals having a child with thalassemia minor or major. So what that tells us is this. Yes, the mutations are possible. We know it must have occurred because it had to have occurred sometime in the past. But it's so rare that it doesn't occur enough for us to observe it in the data sets that we have. So that tells us something. Here is what we get if we have an individual who's healthy who has a child with somebody with thalassemia minor. Now remember, the person with thalassemia minor may or may not be symptomatic. They typically don't even know. On average, half of their offspring are healthy and half of their offspring have thalassemia minor. Okay, interesting. So now what about this? Suppose we have somebody who has thalassemia minor and they have a child with somebody else who has thalassemia minor. That is the only mating that we see with any frequency that gives rise to thalassemia major. And a quarter of their offspring tend to have thalassemia major. Only a quarter. In fact, a quarter of their offspring are perfectly healthy. They have neither thalassemia major nor minor. And half of their offspring have thalassemia minor. Okay, so what is going on here? So in this situation, then, healthy always gives healthy, but minor cross minor doesn't always give minor. There's something else going on. If we look at the genotypes and we look at the genetic transmission properties of this trait, we'll see that it almost matches Mendel, but not quite. Okay, so remember, Mendel said there were four things going on in the traits that he studied. One, it's particulate. Okay, we've already accepted that's all the evidence we've ever seen is that genetics is particulate. Second, there are two of these particles, two genes, coming for each trait. So each trait is determined by two genes of the seven traits he studied. And thirdly, there's one particle from each parent. That's why there's two. Finally, one of them dominates, dominates, and the other one is recessive. Okay, any trait that follows that pattern we call Mendelian. Right, as we saw before, Mendelian traits are rare. So in this case, he was almost right. This is almost correct. I wouldn't say he's almost right. He didn't look at this trait, but his uh, ideas almost fit this one. This one only violates one of those of those things. Particles always, of course. In this case, also, there's two particles determining each determining this trait, and one comes from each parent. But the difference is there's no dominance. There's no dominance here. Okay, Here's what's happening. In this case, we have a healthy individual represented by the genotype big T, big T. Okay, again, two particles per trait. And this individual is big T, big T. Now, 
one particle from each parent. So one of these big T's goes to the kid, and one of these big T's goes to the kid, and so the kid must have genotype big T, big T, which is healthy. Yes, it is possible that one of these big T's can mutate to a little t, but again, we haven't seen it. Okay, so what about this? Healthy cross minor, big T, big T, cross big T, little t. All right, so what do we expect to see from that? Well, this parent can only give a big T, and half of the time, this parent, the other parent, will give a big T, and the other half, it gives a little t. Okay, now we're using the thinking that Mendel used, not the Punnett square. Okay, so that means then that half of the time, the offspring are going to be big T, big T, and the other half of the time, the offspring are going to be big T, little t, healthy, and thalassemia minor. All right, what about this then? Thalassemia minor cross minor, big T, big, little t, big T, little t. In this case, half the time, this individual is going to give a big T, and half the time, this individual is going to give a big T, so it's half times half, which is a quarter for big T, big T. Also, for the little t, little t, half the time it'll get, give a little, half the time a little, so that means a quarter, little t, little t. So, a quarter of the time it'll be healthy, quarter of the time thalassemia major. The other times, though, this one will give a big t or a little t. That happens a quarter of the time because it's a half times a half. But then it can go the other way, too, where we get a little t and a big t. Okay, so what I'm saying is this. Half the time this gives a big t and half the time this gives a little t. So, the probability of big t, little t is going to be one half quarter, but the other possibility is that I get a little t here half the time and a big t here half the time. So again, half times half is a quarter. I have to add those together because I can either get the big t from this individual or from this individual, and that gives me then one half, okay, using again the th same thought process that we learned in the previous lecture. Okay, so that explains why we see what we see. Now, what would happen if this were to occur? Okay, in this situation, remember, this individual is in in reality just we haven't seen enough individuals of this age to actually or of this uh, genotype to actually reproduce to get a sense of it but this is what we would predict based on this evidence if a healthy individual had a child with an individual who had thalassemia major then the healthy individual will always give a big t the, the major individual will always give a little t and you'd end up then with heterozygous uh, thalassemia minor Okay, let me ask this then. Would it have made a difference in this case if we had coded the healthy allele as little t and the thalassemia allele as big t? I want you to work through that and demonstrate the following statement. It would not matter. You could code either way. It wouldn't matter. There's other evidence that this is not dominance. There's no dominance here. Okay, so if we think about this, what are we seeing? Well, what we're seeing here is snapdragons. We're seeing blending. You see that? Here's an individual who's healthy. They have a child with, a, with somebody who's sick, and the offspring are kind of sick. So this then is showing us that this is a blending inheritance. This is actually something that we see here in the snapdragons as well. So healthy, sick, kind of sick. Red, white, pink. Okay. So this kind of situation is more common than Mendelian. Much more common, in fact. So much more common that actually this is one of the reasons why Mendel had so much trouble getting people to believe what he was seeing. Okay, So this looks like generative fluid. Whenever you see that, whenever you see blending inheritance like this, we're looking at what we call incomplete dominance. And it's incomplete in the sense that neither of these alleles, either the big T or the little t, is completely shown in the heterozygote. Okay, and that means that it's partially sick, so the little t is partially coming through, but it's partially healthy, so the big t is coming through. That's the blending part, so that's incomplete dominance.